Good morning. Welcome to the last message, the last uh, meeting of the Remnant Rally here in Coldwater, Michigan. You know, I'm just so flustered because it's the last one, and this has been so precious. Hasn't this been a wonderful blessing to you? Oh, I tell you, I know that we have achieved our goals to get a blessing, be a blessing, and to share a blessing for this special rally focused on the Bibles for Africa project. And God has blessed us tremendously, hasn't he? You know, I was thinking just this morning, God uh, is really interesting because he always sprinkles some additional blessings along the way. I've met old friends. I've met new friends. And I think probably most importantly, and I think maybe for you too, I have had in my heart rekindled a, a deeper appreciation for the word of God. It's something about being involved in this project that helps me realize that I have something so precious to me that I can't take advantage of, that I really need to hold dear to my heart Jesus Christ and the word of God that he's given us. So we are really glad to um, have this opportunity to be here again this morning. Uh, we will have testimonies and wonderful music and a, a um, spirit-inspired message once again from Pastor Mark Howard. So we are looking forward to that. And again, so happy to have you here. And uh, we'll just get right started. Thank you. Good morning, church. Morning. Happy morning. First day of the week. God sends us the sunshine, reminds us of the resurrection. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And we would like to uh, in invite you to go ahead and sing. The words will be on the, uh, on the screen. And our first song is, Oh, How I Love Jesus. sing a song that is one of the favorite songs of all times, The Old Rugged Cross. Not far from here, I see three crosses on a hillside, and you know they're there to remind us, aren't they, that our Savior was placed in the middle of two sinners, and uh, we belonged on the cross. Amen? And so we're going to glory in the Lord and glory in his cross. I want to say thank you to Steve Hemingway and to Barb Hemingway and to Ed Truby. We're, we are so blessed to have them as our musicians. Amen? Well, this might be funny, but would you mind standing up? Would you all just please stand up as we sing? Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. On a hill far away stood an old rocky cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old 
know the most beautiful thing about our message is that Jesus is alive. Amen? We were told to have a quiet heart so that we could think and listen to the voice of God. Amen? Because we serve a living Savior. Isn't that right? We're going to sing that wonderful song this morning, He Lives. And you ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. Amen? And if He doesn't live within your heart today, this is the time to accept Him. This is the time to say, Jesus, come and live in my heart. I want to listen to you. Shall we start to sing? I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He you got this is the third time he lives within my heart amen blessings upon you we're going to ask you to uh, remain standing as we have our opening prayer our father in heaven we praise you and we thank you we thank you, Lord, that as we come before you this morning, we bring our hearts 
that we can't even keep, and so we ask you to take them and keep them for us, Lord. We ask you to purify us because of the blood of your son, Jesus, which was poured out as an offering for us once and for all. We thank you that he is alive as our high priest in heaven, ever living to make intercession for us, and that you are preparing us for the place you have prepared for us. Oh, Lord, we do not want to come empty-handed before your throne, but we want to bring many with us. And we pray again, Father, that you will empower and equip each of us to have the tools we need to help serve you and win souls for you. And so we pray again for our brothers and our sisters in Africa who are pleading for a Bible, that they may share the living word, the truth about Jesus. This morning, Father, as we listen, open our hearts and open our abilities and our means that we might better put to use those things you've given us. In Jesus' name, we praise you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. And the church said, amen. amen. Well, I tell you, Dwight, it's so nice to stand up here again with the president of Remnant Publications, uh, an ambassador for God, I might Amen. add. Yes. yes. And um, I'm just thrilled because um, I'm just thinking about last night. Yes. And I can't wait for you to tell me the results of the offering from last night and, and what the results then is for the weekend. Well, I, I told you that, or you mentioned me about my BlackBerry, right. a little phone <laughs> that I've got that I don't know how to operate yet, mm -hmm. but it gets emails coming in. <clears throat> I'm learning it, by the way. I can learn. They say you can teach an old, old dog new, new tricks. tricks. That's I'm good. not that old, but I still can learn. Anyways, um, we ended up receiving yesterday right here uh, approximately $6,500. Amen? Amen. I'm pretty happy about that. Wow. It's exciting because think of that. That is around, what, 3,250 Bibles. And then if you multiply that by 20, 20. Mm -hmm. think what that does. Then we received approximately, uh, I think, around $2,000 from uh, PayPal or people sending in money through the internet from Australia and different places. So <clears throat> it's neat. Everyone's just to think that here in Coldwater, people are watching around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that. I'm here in Coldwater. How, how do they beam this signal? I mean, I know technically, and it gets Australia, Europe, Africa. It's just amazing. Amen. It sure is. And, well, uh, that's part a blessing. Yes. Wow. <clears throat> well, you know, and we have um, another testimony that we're going to yes. share. This is an exciting one. This you will really, <clears throat> this will really touch your heart. And and before we before we do that, okay. Debbie, if they could get a picture, who? Uh, there's a camera. Can you? I don't know if it'll be shiny, but here's this this young boy. His name is Nicholas, and he's eight years old. Okay. Now you can read that testimony. All right. So this is from eight-year-old Nicholas. Dear Mr. Hall. I wish to thank you and your team for letting me be involved in helping people receive Bibles. While I was three years old, I saw more violence, abuse, and destruction than most people who are old. Praise God for sending me to my grandma and papa's home in Arizona. My grandma and papa gave me my first Bible when I was four years old. No, I could not read. They taught me who Jesus was and about God's unconditional love. They read me stories from my Bible and told me that God was always with me. I have memorized many of my favorite Bible verses. The Lord has since protected my mother, little brother, and I by keeping us safe from Satan. Isn't that amazing? Four years old, can't read, but grandma and grandpa read the Bible, and he memorized those Bible verses. My little brother was born deaf. Mm. I prayed to God to help him hear, and a miracle happened. Matthew can now hear clearly on his right side Amen. and is still deaf on the left. He is only two and a half, but can talk your ear off since his <laughs> speech therapy. He will be going through surgery when he is around three years old to have a mini computer placed on his left side for him to hear. Amen. God is cool at answering <laughs> prayers with miracles. Amen. Isn't you that know something? about that, don't you? Yeah, I love miracles, don't you? 
<laughs> As I grew up closer to Jesus, I continued to share with everyone my Bible. There was a short time that I was in public school. I was told I couldn't bring my Bible, which I would take everywhere with me. That wasn't very good. But God worked it out, and I began to teach other kids to pray during lunch. My teacher even prayed with me. Even though they could not tell the kids about Jesus, I could. Amen. My mother and grandparents have done all they can to keep me in Christian schools. Thank God for Christian grandparents. That's something. Even during the money struggles, because we are not rich, they love my brother and me so much. I wanted to go to this one Christian school, which was very expensive for my family. I prayed for God to help me go there. My pastor and the head elder of our church wrote a letter of recommendation for me to get a partial scholarship, which was a great help. God answered my prayers. The cost is about $5,000 a year, which is a lot. And somehow, God worked it out. Amen. Another miracle. This was one of my many answered prayers. <clears throat> when I was six years old, I told my family I wanted to be a race car driver. And as I was driving by people, I could throw them Bibles through my window. <laughs> After telling my grandma, who reminded me that someone might get hurt, I changed and wanted to, wanted to fly planes and drop Bibles off for people. <laughs> my first thought was to drop them from the plane in midair. Again, my grandma said, someone may get hurt. I said, well, sometimes people just need to be hit with the truth. <laughs> Amen. This, I, I want to meet this young man personally, <laughs> Debbie, because he's a dreamer, isn't he? Yeah. And, and we can't take those dreams away from the young kids. No, That's we tremendous. can't. <clears throat> Understand, I would never want to hurt anyone. My plan was then to wait till I was 16 and then begin taking flying lessons and deliver Bibles to people at the airports. Hmm. Then my grandma told me about a new personal ministry with Terry Breckenridge called Bibles for Africa at church. Wow. Who's there Terry Breckenridge? Must be someone at their church. At their church, okay, yes. Okay, good. I was so excited because now I could help get other kids Bibles without hurting anyone or waiting <laughs> till I am old. 16. <laughs> I was baptized at the age of seven years old, which was a year ago. You see, if my grandparents never gave me a Bible, taught me of God's love, protection, or answered prayers, Matthew and I would not be where we are, and my mother would not have survived someone trying to kill her with a knife. Mm. My mother left the church many years ago, but through me and my love for Jesus, she has returned to the Lord. Amen. I wish to thank you again. It is never too young to receive a Bible. Please tell others to remember the children because we are the future in these last days mm. before Jesus comes to take us all home. Amen. You know, and, and that, that reminded me of a little story that, that I need to share that I think is kind of neat. Um, when we're young and we go to church and we're in our classes, I remember when I was in primary, whatever, and my teachers always talked about guardian angels and not to be afraid. You've got your guardian angels, right? And they're with you, and they, they excel in strength. You haven't got to worry about lions and tigers and bears because, I mean, the angels, that's nothing for them. But as we get older, you know, when we, have you ever, parents, you've taken your small ones, and they, you said, just jump, and daddy will catch you, mommy will catch you, and they do it. They're, they have blind faith. <clears throat> and so... We never, parents, want to take that faith from our children because as we get older, if we're not careful, we'll take that away. Or we tell them to be quiet because they embarrass us. When we were, um, we were at a place, this has been a number of years ago, and we were at a restaurant. And we had been uh, training our children. I mean, they'd get up early in the morning and, and uh, push on the tapes and listen to Bible stories and stuff. And they'd have their quiet time every morning. And so we were working with them in health and, our, and ourselves, too, and, and, and more eating better and getting away from some of the candies and stuff. Well, at this restaurant, um, they handed out pieces of candy, and we had some guests with us. Uh, you talk about getting embarrassed as parents. <laughs> and Seth, our son, was about five or six years old. And so at the end, they passed all these pieces of candy out, and so we didn't pick them up right then. And so Seth is sitting there watching, you know, and, 
And, uh, you know, these people said, well, this w one person said, well, um, Seth, don't you want your candy? Don't you eat that? And <laughs> I'll never forget, he jumped up on the chair. <laughs> he leaned over the table and his hand just went, rah, rah. he just picked up every one of them. He says, no, but I know you'll want them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to slide under that table. And then here's what, here's what this person said. They said, Seth, you are weird. <laughs> and here's what he said. He said, no, we're not. We're spiritual. All right. <laughs> oh, I, I was just red. And, and we were staying at these folks' home that night. And, you know, they came back, and we laughed about that. But here's the thing. Out of the mouth of babes, Amen. right? Amen. You know, the thing of it is, is that as you raise your children, moms and dads, grandparents, you raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. You know, what did he say if it wasn't for my grandmother? Yeah. And my, my grandparents, I wouldn't be where I'm at. And he's, eight year, he's talking like he's 70. He's doing all these things. Don't take the faith away from the young people. And moms and dads, we need to learn to have that faith. And that's what this whole thing is about. It's about miracles. It's about believing. It's about people doing things with never seeing where that Bible is going to go to. And the community that, I mean, they've given this money out of faith, knowing that people are going to get it. It, to me, it's just, and, and, and without 3ABN going around the world where their satellites are on the satellites, where would we be? We could be talking about it and sending letters, but everyone doing their part, to me, it's just an absolute, it, it, it's just tremendous. I, I, I'm speechless, and you all know me. That, I'm not that's, really that's a miracle. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. It? That's it. <laughs> Well, we want to thank Nick for his testimony yes, because it's absolutely. so inspiring, I think, for other children out there yes. that they can do whatever God puts on their heart to do. It certainly is maybe a little bit of a rebuke, but encouragement for us That's right. that we can do whatever God asks us to do. I mean, is it Christ said, except as you become as a child, child. That's it. That's you can't it, enter Debbie. the kingdom of heaven. So we need to try and emulate the kind of faith that Nick is talking about. So th this is a wonderful testimony. Amen. Well, I think now we're going to keep going with the meeting, and I, yeah. and I know that you'll be blessed. And take these messages that you've got, take them home, take them wherever you go, make them practical in your lives. Because people, again, I mentioned before, it's not about a church. Mm -hmm. Your religion is what people see. We've had people come up to us, and they have said they've been so blessed. And it's the little things that they've mentioned, Debbie. Mm -hmm. It's not the big things. It's the little things that they said they have seen and uh, that's exactly what people need to do. They need to see Jesus in you. Amen.
I want to be near to the heart of God, don't you? So we can go home. Our speaker for this hour, for this very special message, is Pastor Mark Howard. We heard from him earlier this weekend when he talked about the Valley of Dry Bones and really impressed upon our hearts that we're all really kind of part of that, but we can be enlivened, quickened by the Spirit of God. Pastor Howard is the pastor of the Coldwater and Burlington churches, and I am thrilled to have been able to get to know him just briefly here during this weekend. And Pastor Howard, let God speak through you now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. How are you doing? Well, it's been an awesome weekend, hasn't it? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things. There are many things I was thinking about here, just even, even uh, talking to Dwight Hall um, backstage. Um, we're planning another rally for Remnant next year, already working on the dates. And if this has been a blessing to you, I really want you to start considering that even now. And also add that to your prayer list. Um, times like this, I believe God uses to draw us together and just inspire us and revive us and remind us why we're here. Amen? You know, and, and uh, I want you to think there are a couple other things that have really st struck me and, and, and grabbed my attention. I think of Debbie, I think of Dave and Marlene this morning, all of our musicians last night, who are contributing uh, to the Lord's work with their own ministries. And uh, then some that you haven't thought about probably, maybe not as much, is, is the whole 3ABN camera crew here. I mean, you know, if you guys could see what goes on behind the scenes, these guys work hard. And, this, and they're doing a wonderful ministry for the Lord. And, and that just reminds me of how many things there are to do for the Lord. Sometimes we say, well, what can I do? I'll tell you, it's endless. You know, if you, put your, if you have a talent that God has given you, put it to use. Don't bury it in the sand. There are lots of things we can do for the Lord to hasten His coming. The Bibles for Africa project is just one thing, and it's a wonderful thing. And I'm excited about that. Uh, the Lord has helped us to reach people just through this rally. I mean, think about it. You'll be in the kingdom of God just because you were here, participated, gave a donation, and somebody's going to come to you. You never preached a sermon in your life, maybe never let out a class in church, maybe, maybe figure you don't have much of a ministry at all. And just because you did something, just because you gave a donation, somebody's going to come to you and say, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Isn't that phenomenal? Praise God for His mercy in letting us do that kind of thing. And I also want you to remember, of course, the whole ministry of 3ABN. We mentioned uh, yesterday Danny Shelton was going to be here, and he didn't make it because his, he was having some problems, his neck problems. I want you to continue uh, to remember him in prayer, as well as the ministry of 3ABN and Remnant Publications. As Dwight Hall shared with us yesterday, these are self-supporting ministries. In other words, they don't have a church that's giving them money. It, it's donations that make these ministries happen. And so keep that in mind. Um, if you've received a blessing, let, let, let the Lord work on your heart and impress you as to how you can help these ministries continue. Amen? Amen. Now, our message today, I've entitled No Soliciting. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we get, get a little bit further into it. I want to start out this morning by telling you something somebody told me once, and you may have heard it. They said, a short pencil is better than a long memory. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? You know, sometimes I've, as, a, as a minister, I, I preach to people, and uh, it's not uncommon. I don't care how on fire a saint may be. It's not uncommon for me in the middle of a message to hear somebody, see somebody kind of go. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? God forbid it's ever been you, Right? You know, you know one reason why that happens? Carry a pen or a pencil with you and jot down what the Lord is impressing you with. I thought to myself this morning, I thought, man, what, it's, what, a, what a fantastic weekend this has been. How do I follow this up? You know what the Lord told me? You don't. It's not about you. Sometimes we as ministers forget that. Sometimes we as, as believers forget that, that the person up here is only somebody that God is going to use to give a message to us. A short pencil is better than a long memory. Do this for me. Make it your purpose when you come to hear a message, and this morning is no exception. This whole weekend is no exception. And try to pick up on three things. How many? Three. Number one, what new thing did I learn? 
that I didn't know before. Uh, how many in here know everything? <laughs> Not one of you. Man, I was going to ask you some questions afterwards, but... <laughs> we all can learn something new. So what new thing did I learn? Have you ever had something grab your attention in a sermon? Or maybe the Lord brings it to you in some other way in your devotional time. You say, wow, that was awesome. And, uh, oh, I'm in a hurry. And you, and you get on with your day, and then you're thinking later, what was that? There was that awesome thing I heard earlier, and it's gone. What new thing did I learn? Short pencil, better than a what? Long memory. Number two, what old thing was I reminded of? Anybody here forget sometimes? I, I forget. And uh, so jot down. Sometimes God will remind us of things that we, need, we, we needed to remember and we've forgotten. Great. What new thing did I learn? What old thing was I reminded of? And number three, the most important, how will I take what I've learned and apply it to my life this week? Because we can listen to all the preaching and do all the Bible study we want, and many of the messages have shared that this week, but if we don't put it into practice in our lives, what good has it done us? What good? I'm going to tell you something. The Bible, as we talked about, when we talked about the Valley of Dry Bones, it's living and powerful, but only when you put it into practice. I mean, God gives the power, but if we won't take and, and try to take that teaching and put it into practice, His power doesn't go anywhere. There's no channel for it to go. See, when I say, I'm going to take that, Lord, and I'm going to act on that, then I step forward, and guess what? His power, it's right there. It works through the Word. But if I won't act on it, I don't experience the power that God wants me to in my Christian experience. So make this a point and a purpose of yours, not just today, but anytime you're in a spiritual setting, how can I apply this to my life? What new thing did I learn? What old thing was I reminded of? How can I put it into practice so I can grow up into Christ-likeness? Amen? Amen? Now, at this time, I'm going to ask you if you will kneel together with me, and we are going to ask the Lord to bless us with His Spirit and His presence. Amen? Our Heavenly Father, Father, praise your name this morning. Praise your name for your goodness and your mercy. Praise your name that we, that we are even here, called out of darkness into the marvelous light that's streaming from the cross of Calvary. And Father, this morning, we just ask for the special blessing of your Holy Spirit as this rally comes to a close, may we be inspired, may we be filled with your spirit and with purpose, may we be enabled, Father, to do the work that you've called us to do as your disciples. And bless us now in the name of Jesus and for his sake, we ask and pray, amen. Now, you know, I haven't always been a Christian, and uh, this was, I'm going to share with you an experience from my pre-Christian days, I'm, I'm afraid maybe it will mirror maybe some of your Christian days, I'm not sure. My wife and I, when we first got married, we used to have these people that would come by the house to sell things, you know, the rainbow vacuum cleaners and other kind of things, you know, and the worst to me was the college kids selling magazines. Anybody ever go through this experience? Because they would not leave for anything. <laughs> I, I had just a couple occasions, you know, they're there, they, they, they'd take a bus from campus, they'd drop them off in your neighborhood, and, and they go around knocking on your doors, and then they get in and sell you magazines. Sorry, I really don't, I'm not interested, I don't read magazines. Well, how about this magazine? Well, you know, I really don't. Well, we could give it to you half price. I, really, I, I don't get magazines. I could give it to you, like, for, for only a quarter of the price, you know, and just on and on and on. And, and so what I began to do, I'm almost ashamed to say, is that on the weekends, my wife and I didn't do anything on the weekends. It was we would work during the week, and I wasn't going to church or anything like that. And I'd get those, well, we, we began to keep the blinds closed, okay? And you'd have the knock at the door. Now, some of you have learned this already, 
But you, we had a peephole in the door, but you can't look out the peephole because you can see a person looking through the peephole. You know there's an eye behind it. And you know they're home. I learned that as a Bible worker. <laughs> the Lord has a sense of humor. Because when I became a Christian, he sent me out uh, uh, going knocking door to door for him. So kind of a turn of events. But I wouldn't look out the peephole. I would go into the other room and I'd peek out the blinds to see who was there. And I didn't open the door for those salespeople. We weren't home. Now, it would have been easier probably for me to put that no soliciting sign up on the door. That would have been probably the easiest thing to do. You know what that means, right? No soliciting. It means don't come to my house selling anything. I learned that as a Bible worker too. See, because you knock on the door and they say, hey, can't you read? And I say, I'm not selling anything. I'm giving it away. Right? right? <laughs> but anyway, no soliciting. Don't come around here. I'm not interested in what you have to sell. I want you to open your Bibles to Revelation 3. It's so interesting how the Lord works and how the Holy Spirit works. I was just uh, talking to Dwight Hall, and, and, and he shared this scripture just the other day, and I was thinking, you know, that's, I knew the message I was going to be presenting this morning, and it's just interesting how the Lord pulls so many things together. I mean, have you heard things repeated through this weekend? Certain things God's trying to get across to our hearts, the th whole theme of surrendering our hearts and our lives to Him. I mean, um, the Lord is in this. Well, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to verse 14. In Revelation chapter 3, you have what, what is often called the letters to the churches. Now, what's interesting to me about Revelation chapters 2 and 3, seven letters to seven churches, it starts out in chapter 1 of Revelation showing a picture of Christ, and then he begins to dictate the letters. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. To the angel in the church of Smyrna, write this. In other words, Jesus himself is dictating letters, epistles to the churches. You know, we have the epistle of Paul to the Romans. We have the epistle of Paul to the Colossians. We have the first and second epistle. Epistle is just a Greek word that's transliterated. It means a letter. The letter of Peter, the first letter of Peter, the second letter. These are seven letters from Christ himself. Isn't that incredible? Amen. And in just those two chapters of the Bible, Jesus speaks to these seven churches. Those of you who have studied this, you can see characteristics in those churches that we as Christians face and struggle with. You can also see the history of the Christian church, culminating with this last church, the church of Laodicea. Interestingly, the name Laodicea itself means a judging of the people or a people judged. It's the last church before Christ appears, living in a time of judgment. Verse 14, notice, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, before I go on, we'll go back to that. I want you to jump to verse 20 with me. This is the one that we looked at the other morning. And I think that you're probably familiar with this passage. I mean, this is one that I've heard over and over and over again. Verse 20 says, Jesus speaking here, dictating this letter, behold, I what? Stand at the door and knock. And if any man, what, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is standing, knocking at the door of your heart, friend. You've heard that before. Now, here's what's fascinating to me. If you go back just a few verses, notice what Jesus says in verse 18. I counsel you to what? Buy. To what? Buy, Buy from me. Put the two together. He's standing at the door and knocking, and he's selling some things. No soliciting. I prayed about the message to give this morning. Lord, what message do we as your people need?
We talk about Jesus standing at the door and knocking. We talk about the importance of opening the door. Sometimes I wonder if we know what it means to open the door to Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't just stand there and knock. Jesus has things that we desperately need. The problem is, I believe, and I think this is what Jesus is highlighting here, the problem is we don't think that we need them. We have the no soliciting sign on the door. Go away, mister. Don't need what you're selling. Go back to verse 14 and let's read through this. Let's see if we can gain some insight as to what the Lord would say to us today. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the what? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the faithful and true what? Witness. Now that's going to come to play in a moment. Verse 15, I what? I know your works. Now let me tell you something else that just is fascinating to me. In every single letter that Christ dictates, the first thing He says to every single church is not, I know your faith, but to every single church, no exception, the epistle of Jesus. Somebody today would say, Jesus, you need to read Paul. You don't understand grace. Jesus, without exception, says, I know your works. The Bible is plain over and over that it's through our works that we evidence our faith. Now listen, Jesus doesn't misunderstand the gospel. Jesus knows that our works don't save us. If anybody knows it, Jesus knows it. But He also wants us to be clear that we don't play games with ourselves and think that we can go around saying we have faith. If we don't have corresponding works, our, our faith is a lie. I know your works, Jesus says. What does it say? What did Jesus Himself say in Matthew chapter 5? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your faith. That they may see your good works and glorify who? You? Your Father in heaven. This, this has been a recurring theme throughout this weekend. The point is this. God is in the business of transforming lives. And it's when the life is transformed that God is glorified. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, this world is sick and tired of a powerless Christianity. One author puts it this way, the sin of the world's impenitence, their refusal to repent, the sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. They look in the church and, and church people are saying one thing but doing another thing. It's when we live that Christian life, that transformed life, as Pastor Jackson talked about yesterday, transformers, as Pastor Hall was talking about in his own life and how the Lord has changed his life. It's when people see that, that they realize there's a power to this. This isn't make-believe. This is real. I mean, we can hold creation seminars from now until the Lord comes, trying to prove to people that God really did create it. Let God create in you a clean heart, and you don't have to argue anymore. I mean, the Apostle Paul doesn't even devote an entire chapter in what he writes to proving that God created. He just says in Hebrews 11, by faith, I believe that the world's refrained by the Word of God. You let God change your life, and that will be the sign and the evidence, and men will glorify God in heaven. The faithful and true witness says, I know your works. Verse 15, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. I could wish. Now, now, hot, we know what hot is. Just on fire for the Lord. How many of you, when you 
first came to the Lord, I hate to say it that way, but that's so true too often. When you first came to the Lord, were so excited about what you were learning, you went and, and, and you tried to tell everybody. And you put your foot in your mouth more times, more often than not, by saying the wrong thing. Have you done that before? And then here's what we do. We start to say, well, I went overboard and everything. You were hot. I went overboard and I just got, I got to, get, I got to calm things down a little bit. I just got to, what's the word we use today? I got to get balanced. Balance. It's an interesting word today. Balance is not some halfway compromise between truth and error because living the truth fully offends people. That's not a balanced life. Let me tell you something. God's word and God's truth is balanced. When a person first comes to the Lord, it's so often we'll go and we'll witness to somebody and we will put our foot in our mouth. We'll say something wrong. We're hot, but what happens too often is we settle back into lukewarm and then we call ourselves balanced. Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Totally indifferent to religion. The Apostle Paul was hot when the Lord came to him. He had a zeal for God. In fact, his zeal for God had him actually killing Christians. But the Lord preferred that to lukewarmness because he was able to do something with it. He knew he could take this man who was on fire for him, and if he could reveal his truth to him, Paul would be a mighty power for good. And he was. Praise God for that. Then there was that thief on the cross. Now, he was cold. He had no interest in religion. He had no interest in religious things. He wasn't living out what he knew, but there he was hanging on that cross, and he saw Jesus, and his heart was touched, and he saw and heard the cry of Jesus and the concern for others. And he looked over, and he said, Lord, save me in your kingdom when you come. This man had been cold, but the Lord could take that and inspire warmth in his heart. But he says here, oh, I wish you were cold or hot. But verse 16 says, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You know, the Bible pictures Jesus as standing as our representative before the Father. He's our advocate, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, one who stands in defense of another. Jesus stands in the presence of the Father, and he pleads our case. When he says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth, what he says is, I'm not going to be your defense anymore. I'm not going to speak for you anymore in your lukewarm state. Does that make you uneasy? It should. Let let me tell you something. If Jesus isn't speaking for us, if Jesus isn't taking up our case, you can talk talk all you want about the heavenly city. You're not going to be there. I'm not going to be there. Not without our advocate. This ought to concern us. Jesus is those who are lukewarm. I can't stand in defense of. Makes me want to know what it means to be lukewarm. How about you? Well, he doesn't leave us hanging. Jesus tells us right here. Notice, verse 16 again. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, verse 17, because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and what? Have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Let me ask you a simple question. Is the problem, do you feel, is the problem with Laodicea that they're wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked? Is it a problem? Is it a problem? Sure it is. Is it the the problem? Isn't that the same condition of one who's cold? And maybe even one who's hot in some ways, like the Apostle Paul? I mean, who, who is there who hasn't sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? The Bible says all have. So the key problem with Laodicea, the key problem of lukewarmness is not that a person is wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. What is it? 
They think that they're rich when they're really poor. They think that they're clothed when they're really naked. They think they can see just fine when they're as blind as a bat. The problem with Laodicea is not that the Lord is not able to, that the Lord does not have power to save them. He says many places in the Word, my arm is not shortened that I cannot save. He can save to the uttermost all who come to God through Him, the Bible says of Jesus Christ. The problem with Laodicea is they'll never come to Him because they don't have a problem. No soliciting, mister, I don't need what you have. The worst part about this is the ones Jesus is addressing here are not the people, the heathens that are out in the world living for the world. They're the majority of the church-going folk. And Jesus pleads here. I counsel you, verse 18, to buy from me. The problem with Laodicea is they don't see their need. They don't see their need. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5 with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 5. We're going to Luke chapter 5, verse 29. That's where we'll begin. Luke chapter 5 and verse 29. Then Levi, this is Levi Matthew, his disciple, the tax collector. Levi gave him, Jesus, a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with what? Tax collectors. Publican is another word for that. Tax collectors and sinners. You have to understand something about the tax collectors. The, tax, the, the, the Jews were under the authority of the Roman rule. In other words, Rome ruled over the Jews and ruled over Jerusalem. Uh, why was that? I mean, God had told him he was going to make a great nation of them. Why was Rome ruling over them? Because of their disobedience. And God told them that repeatedly. Let them go into captivity, first to Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and now the empire of Rome. Those Jews who would work for the Roman gov government, these, these tax, tax collectors, they were seen as traitors to their country. And what's more, because they didn't receive any support from their countrymen, they would just rip people off left and right when they taxed them. So tax collectors were looked upon as the lowest of the low. Matthew, one of Christ's disciples, was a tax collector. How many of you have heard people say, and people argue this with me sometimes, I and mean, we go to all lengths sometimes to reach people, and they say, well, Jesus, uh, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. That's what people always throw out there. You know, well, I'm just going to go hang out at the bar for a while and see if I can find a Bible study. Well, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. You've heard people say things like that. Let me tell you something. This is where it's taken from in the Bible. Where did Jesus go? Where he was invited. In other words, he went somewhere. Jesus will minister to anybody, but the person has to be in a state of mind where they want to be ministered to. Matthew had invited Jesus over his to his house, and he invited all his tax collector buddies, and he said, you've got to come hear this guy. Of course, Jesus isn't going to pass up that opportunity. So here he is, sitting with the tax collectors and sinners. Now, this is what the, uh, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes complained about. In verse 31 says this, Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. How many of you go to the doctor when you're feeling well? 
That's all Jesus was saying. We don't go to the doctor when we're feeling well. We don't go to the doctor unless we're sick. Jesus is the great physician of the soul. He says, verse 32, I have not come to call the what? Righteous, but what? Sinners to change. That's what repentance means. Jesus said, I've come to call the sinners to change. Now, was he calling the Pharisees righteous? No, but he knew that in their own minds, they didn't see any need for change. And Jesus said, because you see no need for change in your own life, I can't minister to you. You've got the no soliciting sign on the door. Are you following me? These were religious leaders. These men knew the Bible probably better than most of us know it. And they were in church every week too. And they paid tithe and offering too. And so they thought, I'm not like that common sinner that we're just bringing in and we're doing our evangelistic campaign. We're trying to bring these people in. I'm not like that. I'm not like those people that I feel uncomfortable about when they come into church because they're still dressing like the world and things like that because they haven't learned the truth yet. I don't feel comfortable with that. Now, I'm not telling you to feel comfortable with sin, but I'm going to tell you something. These Pharisees, the key characteristic is they didn't sense their own personal need for change. See, they thought Christianity was a one-time thing. You've heard people say it today. People come to me and say, Pastor, I was saved 20 years ago. If that's the last time you were saved, get saved again. <laughs> My Bible says, the Apostle Paul speaking, that I die daily. Amen. And if you die daily, you have to be born again daily. Right? They didn't see their need for change. Let me bring it to a uh, little more practical setting. It's a friend of mine. I was talking to him about, um, we were talking, got to talking about parenting. He said, you know, I met this young lady. She was interested in parenting, so she said. He said, I really want to learn how to be a better parent. I want to be a better Christian parent. And he said, uh, you know, I know a really good book on that. It's, named, it's called Child Guidance. It's excellent. And he said immediately that she's like, uh-uh. I don't, I don't. No, I don't, I don't like child guidance. He's like, what do you mean, child guidance? I mean, you know the book? Yeah, I don't, I don't like that book. He says, why? She says, it makes me feel like a bad mother. <laughs> makes me feel like a bad mother. Let me ask you a question. Did she want to know how to change? No, she wanted some health, self-help book that was going to tell her that she was just doing fine as she was. See, we wear it on the surface and we say, yeah, I love Jesus. I want to change. I know I need change. I know I'm a sinner. But as soon as something's pointed out that needs changing, we get all defensive and all hair on the back of our neck bristles up. And we say, don't you talk to me about change. Makes me feel like a bad mother. Jesus is looking for people who know they need change who don't have the no soliciting sign on the door. He says, I counsel you in verse 18. Is that right? I've, I've lost my place. Okay, I'm back. I counsel you, verse 18 of Revelation 3, to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. I want to spend just a little bit of time on these things that Jesus is talking about here. Gold tried in the fire. Hold your finger there and go with me back just a little bit to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 6. 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. The Bible says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a what? Little while if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Do you experience trials in your Christian life? 
Brothers and sisters, I, I, I can't express this. I was talking about it the other day. I think the one thing that probably is heavier to my heart than any is this mentality that's come into Christianity that says that Christianity ought to be a walk in the park. Nobody, uh, I'm having a hard time, Pastor. I'm having this hard time struggling. You know why? Because you got this sinful nature you've been feeding and it's grown into a huge monster. And it's got a grip on you now, and it's bigger than you because you keep shoveling food its way. Right? By eating the, the things of the world, watching worldly programs, eating worldly food, doing worldly things, having worldly friends. And it just feeds that nature and feeds that nature and feeds that nature. And then when we finally decide we're going to put up a little fight, we wonder that that nature is so strong. Peter says there may be a need for you to go through trials. Why? Verse 7, so that the what? Genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold, though it be tested by fire, tried in the fire, may be found to the praise and the honor of glory. I'm sorry, to the praise and the honor and the glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when he comes in the clouds again, do you want a faith that's going to stand the test? Matthew 18, verse 8, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Think about that one for a minute. The words of Jesus, when the Son of Man comes. I mean, look at the world today. Everybody's a Christian today. Everybody's getting Christ, getting Christianity. Oh, everybody's a believer. We get to the point now, we're getting to the point where we say, it doesn't matter what you believe in the Bible as long as you say you love Jesus because everybody's saying it. And Jesus himself says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Is there going to be that true faith that's going to stand the test? No, because Christians want an easy religion. We want a religion that doesn't affect our daily lives. We want to be able to put the no soliciting sign up and still feel like we have a place in the kingdom. gold, Jesus says. You have need of gold tried in the fire. You still have an experience you don't, you need to gain that you don't have yet. You need to go through some refining in your life. You need to experience a little heat and a little pressure so that when the test comes, you'll stand and you'll shine. One of the biggest problems I believe in the church today is that too many are forgetting the reason for their existence, that is, Christians. We are here, brothers and sisters, to carry on the work of the Master. As in the presentation yesterday morning by John Dinsey, he shared with us how we are ambassadors for Christ. Oh, isn't that, I mean, I, I, I was, that just sent chills up my spine when I heard it again. I mean, sometimes you just, that was one of those old things that I'd be reminded of and jot down ambassadors for Christ, somebody who carries the full authority of another kingdom and comes and represents that kingdom to others. It didn't say pastors are an ambassador for Christ. It says we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We say, I don't know why I'm struggling my Christian experience. Let me ask you, are you living a Christian experience? And let me clarify, I'm not just talking about, do you, did you stop watching this and did you stop doing this? You can cut certain things out of your life. What are you putting back in it? Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. What are you doing in your personal Christian experience to see that souls are in the kingdom? And if you can't answer that question in your own mind, if even now that's bringing conviction to your mind, say, I don't know that I'm doing anything, there's your answer. That's why you're struggling in your Christian experience. Because you're not putting it into practice. The reason I eat a certain way, the reason I live a certain way, the reason I don't watch certain things is so that I can carry out the mission of reaching the world for Christ and display His character. See, if I lose that purpose, then I'm doing all these other things, but why? And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. God can and will use each one of us to reach a soul for Him. And I'll tell you, when you see somebody making a decision for Christ because of your witness, oh, you'll catch the bug. 
that's a good bug to catch. You'll realize why the struggle won't seem like as much struggle anymore when you realize a soul, just one soul can be saved through your influence. You'll forget about all those trials that you have. Gold tried in the fire. And then white raiment that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness does not appear. I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Now, you probably thought I was going to say 64. We looked at that. Pastor Jackson went to that yesterday, Isaiah 64, 6, that tells us, and I think most of you are familiar with it, all of our righteous, righteous, righteousnesses, as it words it there, are as filthy rags. So it pictures righteousness as a garment. Ours as what kind of garment? Like Dwight Hall's shirt yesterday morning. Lord have mercy. <laughs> this is Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Now notice what it says here. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has what? Clothed me with the what? Garments of salvation and covered me with what? The robe of righteousness. So we have garments, we have a robe, and it's filthy. Christ says, you've got a filthy robe, but guess what? Knock, knock, knock. I'm here. Buy from me. I have what you need. I have something that will cover that filthiness up. It's my robe of righteousness. Are you with me on that? I want to show you something else in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. This whole robe of righteousness thing has been perverted among God's people. I mean, let's look at Revelation 19, and we'll flesh this out a little bit. Revelation 19, verse 7. Revelation 19, verse 7. Are you there? Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Who, give who glory? Give the Lord glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. Here she's got a white robe or white garment. For the fine linen is the what? Righteous acts of who? The saints. Brothers and sisters, if we receive the robe of Christ's righteousness, number one, it is not given by God to cloak sin. It's not just given to throw over top of your sin. Like, I'm a sinner, but look at this. I'm going to trick God. Jesus put this robe on. Look, Father, I've got this. God knows better. He looks upon the heart. The robe of righteousness, we sell the Lord short. We say, I'm never going to be able to be like Jesus. I can't change my life. I'm not going to be able to be transformed. But praise God, he's covered me in the robe of righteousness. That's heresy. Are you telling me Christ doesn't have enough power to give you a robe that's going to change your life? Hallelujah. That's what the robe of righteousness is about. It's a living righteousness, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. This is what it's saying. Revelation 19 isn't telling us the saints have all their own righteousness, and that's how they're going to be saved. When it says that they're clothed in the righteous acts, this white garment, this white linen, <clears throat> this fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, it's simply saying that as God gives them righteousness, it's seen in their life, just like we read earlier with the works. One more text on that, 1 John chapter 3. Just go back before Revelation, 1 John chapter 3, and notice verse 7 with me. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. Are you there? <clears throat> notice what John says. Little children, let no one what? Deceive you. So already you know that what he's about to talk about is a point of, a key point of deception. This is an area where the devil's going to try to try to deceive people. Let no one deceive you. He who what? Who doeth righteousness. Who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. John says, don't let anybody come and tell you, fool you and trick you and deceive you with some fancy talk about some righteousness that doesn't change how you act. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Now, I was reading this, it, it's been about a year or so now, there was this debate over this, some of you are familiar with the SpongeBob SquarePants cartoon. I hope most of you aren't, but 
You hear about little bits and pieces, and you see the lunch boxes and things in the stores. Anyway, I was reading this online about this, this, this SpongeBob SquarePants. The issue came out within this cartoon for kids where they were playing around with the identity of this character where, you know, kind of where he may be homosexual. And so there was an, there was an uproar in the Christian community about how we would let that kind of thing happen. And there was all kinds of epithets that were thrown at the, the, the SpongeBob program and everything else. And so in the magazine Christianity Today, and I wish I had saved the, uh, the uh, date. I didn't. I just saved the quote. They asked Phil Vischer, who is one of the creators of VeggieTales, the little cartoon thing that isn't a whole lot better than SpongeBob, but at any rate, he, um, he is commenting on this whole issue, and this is what he says. I found it fascinating. To be honest, he says, I'm not really sure what we're trying to accomplish here. I find it somewhat baffling the great shock that we evangelicals register when we catch the world acting, well, worldly. I mean, isn't that kind of the point, he says? They're the world, right? Why are we so surprised that the world is acting like the world? Now listen to the next thing that he says. Fascinating. When you start with the assumption that the world has fallen, you're much less likely to be disappointed when you find that that's actually the case. As for me, I'm anxiously waiting the day the world registers great shock at the sight of Christians acting Christianly. Phil Fisher says, this is a, you know, we always in an uproar when the world acts worldly. Well, that shouldn't surprise us. What I want to see is when we're surprising everybody else and they're saying, wow, look at these Christians. They're acting like Christ. Oh, for a righteousness, white raiment Christ is selling to cover our nakedness. No soliciting. No thanks, Lord. I think I got plenty of that. I think I'm doing pretty good. And last thing Jesus offers to sell that church of Laodicea is I salve. You know, the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I can't tell you how many Christians tell me, you know, I just, I have this feeling in my heart. I, I, in spite of the plain utterances of the Word of God, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death, it says in Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 12. Jesus says, you need ISAB, church. You need spiritual vision. You're not seeing clearly. You know, we've lost the ability to discriminate between that which is holy and that which is unholy. And I want to talk to the saints this morning. I mean, I was watching. Last night, we had a wonderful concert here. And I, and I want to tell you that we, as God's remnant people, one of the things that we believe in is maintaining the holiness of, of church gatherings and sacred gatherings. I had a woman come up to me last night and some others, not of our faith, not a Seventh-day Adventist, don't know what her emphasis has been in her church, and she said, you know, I just want to tell you, I appreciated so much that when the songs were over, nobody did all this for the performers. Amen. They said, Amen. She said, it seemed to maintain an atmosphere of reverence. It was funny that she said that because I sat there during the concert and I was watching people. And you could see some had tears in their eyes just from the way the Lord was using that music. Or people were looking thoughtful and actually, I mean, really reflective. They were thinking about what was being sung. When we start, when we start to get, we want to copy the world, we want to do all this, and we want to cheer people on like the world. Look. We don't cheer. We're not performers up here. I'm not a performer today. But what, what's happened is in God's church, we're losing discernment between the sacred and the common. We say, well, the world does it this way, and I don't see what's wrong with it. And it gets so bad that we don't. We don't even see the problem with it anymore, and we think that anybody who does bring up that it probably shouldn't be this way, they're not balanced. Jesus says, you need ISAF. You can't even tell, you can't even see, you can't even discern between the sacred 
and the common. I was just on the internet. In fact, I got a, I got a letter to pastors talking about innovative pastoring. There's a pastor in Cleveland, Ohio. He's trying to reach the masses, and so here's what he's done. He's come up with a church that he calls 100% religion-free. They meet in the movie theater. They use popcorn buckets for the offering. They do comedy skits, stand-up comedy acts interspersed. And, and, and he's taken a, taken a rap video about girls with big bottoms, and he's redone it into girls with big Bibles. I mean, what, what's happened to the discernment of God's people? What's happened to that which is holy? You need eye salve, Jesus says. No, no, I don't, Lord. I see just fine. I know who's extreme in the church and who's not. I'm a balanced individual. No soliciting. Let me tell you something. Those of you gathered here, all who are watching, the greatest danger of God's church now, the greatest danger you have, the greatest danger you have is not realizing that you need Jesus today as much as you ever needed him. You still need change. I still need change. Jesus is coming, and there's still a getting ready that must take place. Jesus is coming to us. He sees our need. We want to put that no soliciting. No, 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 Lord, you don't understand. Just like Peter, right? Here's the apostle Peter. Jesus said, Peter, you got some problems, you got some issues. I know that you've got some struggles you really need to work on. Look, the time's coming up, you're going to deny me. <laughs> Lord, you don't know me, Peter said. <laughs> I, I, you don't know me as good as I know me, Peter said. I hear what you're saying, but the rest of them may forsake you, but not me, Lord. Not me. No, I'm going to hang in there. I'll, I'll die for you, Lord. See, Peter thought he knew himself better than Christ knew him. We do that too much. We think we know ourselves better than Jesus knows us. Lord comes knocking at our door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. No thanks, Lord. Jesus says, if any man hear my voice and open the door. Well, how do you open the door? Corey talked the other day. In that story of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4, that we are to break off our sins by doing what's right. Start to put into practice in your life those things that are right. When the Lord comes to you and convicts you of something, make a change. You know, I regularly tell people when they come to me, I mean, there are a lot of things to change in your life when you come to Christ. You can't do it all overnight. But let me tell you something this morning. You can't taper off sin. I mean, there are some things that are going to take you time to get past. They're bad habits. But if you have sinful practices in your life, you, you try to taper off, and they get a little hook in you, and they're just going to keep pulling you back away from Christ, pulling you back away. <clears throat> Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Do you hear his voice knocking? Lord, I'm not going to deny you, Peter says. You don't know me as well as I know. I know you mean well. No soliciting. There Peter sat, stood in the judgment hall. Jesus is in the judgment hall. Peter's in the courtyard. Denies him once, denies him twice, doesn't even realize he's doing it. Some of us are taking the path back where we came from, step by step. We ought to have... We need spiritual discernment. We don't even see where we're going. Blinded. Third time Peter denies Christ. The rooster crows. Peter hears it. Jesus hears it. Looks across the courtyard. Catches Peter's eye. And then Peter realizes he didn't know himself as well as he thought he did. How about you this morning? What kind of sign do you have on your door when Jesus comes knocking?
Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It's one of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible, but he doesn't open the door. He says, if any man hear my voice, if any woman hear my voice and open the door, then I'll come in. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, you can hear his voice, but you can put that sign up. You can be peeking through the blinds like I used to do. Or you can open the door. You say, how do I open the door, Pastor? First and foremost, tell Jesus you want to live for him. And then listen, whatever he's revealing in your life, start putting it into practice and see the power of God. Say, Lord, I need the gold tried in the fire. I need that robe of righteousness. I need spiritual discernment. Look, Jesus is offering it. And what's more in Isaiah, he says he sells without money and without price. You can't beat that deal. How many of you want to have what Jesus is selling? How many of you want to make sure your door will be open to him when he comes to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, this morning, I just pray that you will take to your heart the prayers, the requests, the heart's desire of each one here. Lord, help us to open our door, the door of our heart to you so that you may come in to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com or you can call us at 616-676-3705. You can also write to Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan. 49301. Our email address is hope at hopevideo.com. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.